During the Tet holiday, traditionally a period of ceasefire, the North Vietnamese military commander, General Vo Nguyen Jap, chose January 31, 1968 to launch coordinated offensive surprise attacks aimed at 100 cities in the south of the country, breaking the stalemate in Vietnam. In northeast Quang Tri province, Marines, South Vietnamese, and U.S. Army forces held several locations. The most critical strategic location was the Dong Ha Bridge and the Qua Viet River. This was the headquarters of 3rd Marine Division and 9th Marine Regiment. Assigned to this location was Battalion Landing Team, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marine Regiment. Facing this small force of 642 Marines and Navy corpsmen, and unknown to the Marines at this time, was the 10,000 strong North Vietnamese Army 320th Division. Hello, I'm Colin Heaton with Forgotten History, and this is the Living Legends Edition, and we will be discussing the Battle of Dong Ha and Dai Do, and the presentation will be given by Medal of Honor recipient, then Captain, retired Major General James E. Livingston. My name is uh, James Everett Livingston. Uh, I'm a retired Major General from the United States Marine Corps. My time of service in the Marine Corps was from 1961 to 1995. I had the opportunity to command every level in the Marine Corps, and I had three uh, tours in Vietnam. My uh, first uh, tour was there in 63 and 64, primarily off the coast of Vietnam and uh, the uh, operations around in, in Vietnam were primarily counterinsurgency operations. I went back in 1967 and 68 and became the commanding officer of uh, Echo Company 2nd Battalion 4th Marines and I joined that particular union at Dong Ha in approximately uh, September 1967. And I served as a company commander of Echo Company from sep September 67 to May of 68 when I was wounded in the battle we'll discuss here in a moment, the Battle of Dong Ha against the North Vietnamese. My third trip to Vietnam, I went back in 74 and 75 and I helped coordinate the evacuation of Saigon. I helped uh, coordinate the RV intervac, uh, the takedown of the Maguez that was on the way to the Koh Tang Island and sort of closed Vietnam out, and that was my tours, three tours in Vietnam. As far as the uh, battle we're sort of working on or looking at today is the Battle of Dong Ha. And I'm gonna pose the questions that have been asked me about this particular battle and give you answers as I recall based on many years ago and uh, not being associated totally with the every aspect of the battle, but I'll give you my information as I saw it and witnesses uh, there for about a day uh, when the Echo Company and I was the company commander was involved significantly in that operation. The first question was what, when, and where was the Battle of Dido and Dong Ha? The battle started approximately around the 30th of April of 1968 and what triggered the event is a North Vietnamese shoulder shot at one of the uh, Navy craft that went out to the ocean, uh, uploaded with supplies and brought it back to Dong Ha, which was a logistic supply base for all the Marine Corps elements and Army units in what is called Northern I Corps, uh, along Route 9 and Route 1. And uh, from this location, and uh, they'd bring in supplies and uh, they would use uh, trucks and helicopters to redistribute those uh, supplies to operational units. Uh, my unit was specifically located near Dong Ha on the 30th of April, and we were providing security for a bridge on Route 1 that crossed from uh, the Qua Viet River. And uh, I received word that the uh, battalion had been engaged in some operations. They had received fire, and they were attacked in various enemy locations. 
as that battle became more involved and it began to became, become very apparent that the uh, size of the force that the uh, Second Battalion Fourth Marines were involved in was a very significant force. Uh, it had bogged down a company, uh, couple of companies in uh, Second Battalion Fourth Marines. One of the battalion's uh, company commanders had been wounded in a medevac, a guy named Jim Williams. And uh, as the battle proceeded, the battalion commander made the assessment he didn't have the assets to take care of the force that they had uh, engaged. And I had been assigned to the 3rd Marine Division as a security force, so he asked for me to be returned to 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines to assist in this particular operation. Associated with the Battle of Don Hall, ultimately became the, the village of Zido, which is along Jones's Creek, and it's a creek that runs sort of north-south between the uh, Quaviet River and the Ben High River. In retrospect, what happened was that the uh, battalion commander asked for me to come join them in this particular fight based on his assessment. He didn't have the forces to deal with the threat that they had engaged with. The 3rd Marine Division uh, chopped me back to the 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, which means they reassigned me back to the 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines. And I uh, moved down the Quaviat River, moving uh, west to east towards the ocean along the Quaviat and uh, linked up with the 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines headquarters. And the battalion had been involved in a very significant fight. They'd been four, three companies from the battalion involved and there also been another company from uh, 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines involved. And this particular company had just been hammered and sort of been pulled back and I helped reorganize them on the evening of 1 May when I joined the battalion. And uh, a lot of Marines had been killed, the company commander had been killed. And so the assessment was uh, that the attack had stalled. A golf company had, uh, was assigned to take the village of Dido and had stalled and got into the edge of the village and was being threatened. The other companies were disposed where they couldn't take action at that particular point. And as again, the other company from one of the 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines was not available because of the fact they were just not combat effective. So we reorganized and got uh, associated with the uh, train, got the best threat analysis we could come up with with respect to what might be in front of us, looking at all the support and arms that were available in terms of air, helicopter gunships, naval gunfire, artillery, or all varieties, and also what kind of support the other companies could potentially provide for us uh, in terms of whatever our mission may be later on. And it turned out that evening that we got sort of all the forces basically realigned to the extent we could under threat that the battalion commander called me in about three o'clock that morning of two May and told me my job was to attack basically through the same position that company from 1-3 attack, attack uh, through across 500 meters of open rice paddies and take the village of Dido in coordination with the uh, golf company a Secretary of Fourth Marines, which was uh, commanded by Captain J.R. Vargas. And Vargas would also be the second recipient of the Medal of Honor based on this particular battle. So I called the platoon commanders together. We decided on a course of action. <clears throat> and the course of action was simply this. We would put two companies, two platoons up, one company back in reserve, and the company headquarters would be between the two assault companies and the reserve platoon or assault platoons in the reserve platoon. So at five o'clock that morning uh, we commenced the assault after I told the Marines after lining them up on what we call the forward edge of the battle area. Uh, we come, uh, told the Marines to fix bayonets and probably was one of the most big bayonet charges of the Vietnam War and we moved out with all the support and arms we could coordinate and also with some assistance from Golf Company which was on the edge of the battle uh, field or the village of Dido. As we approached and got closer into the enemy, it became very apparent they were all in bunkers. They had a very small aperture and they would allow the Marines to close on them very close. Then most of the Marines who got shot were shot in the head. And we lost a significant number of Marines and my two assault platoons sort of uh, got stuck. And so what I did at that point, uh, we uh, used the old classic Marine tactic. When you take in a, a fortified position or a build-up area, the first thing you want to do is create a penetration where you can flank it 
on either side and you won't be facing the bunkers head on. So I took the reserve platoon with my company headquarters. We penetrated the lines. There were about 100 bunkers there. And at this position, we were able to roll these uh, 100 bunkers up, destroy the enemy forces, which was significant. And after the fight was over, I linked up with a hotel uh, golf company, I'm sorry. And we began to coordinate the defense of that edge of the battle of, of, of the village of Dido. Uh, unfortunately, Echo had taken some real hits. Uh, I went in there with about 180 and to take that village and to link up with a golf company. It, uh, it had treated Echo down very significantly. As a matter of fact, it was sad. I had about 180 Marines and uh, there were only about 35 or 40 left that were effective. The rest of them had been killed or wounded, but we had accomplished our mission. We had linked up with a golf company and sort of uh, been able to take the first uh, significant step in seizing uh, Dido Village. Later on that afternoon, after we consolidated the forces, reorganized, redistributed ammunition, fed the troops, got all the metal backs out, got all the dead bodies out, uh, the battalion commander, General, uh, later Brigadier General Bill Weiss, uh, Secretary of Fourth Marine CO, had directed that Hotel Company, one of the other companies that had been beat up pretty bad and had lost their company commander in the past, to uh, continue the attack. As far as the uh, question they proposed for me, just to summarize this, what was the numerical superiority and positions of the enemy? As I said, their positions was in bunkers. Their superiority was excellent. It was obviously, it was a big force. They had all the uh, weapons. There were new troops. They had new equipment. So they, they were the, one of the superior forces coming from North Vietnam. And Dong Ha just, in retrospect, was a significant target because at Dong Ha, uh, the supply base was located there, all the artillery was located there, and also the headquarters for the Third Marine Division. So it became a strategic target after Hue, very strategic target after Hue, because the North Vietnamese were convinced if they could take that location, it may have terminated the war. I mean, it was that significant because it supplied, uh, provided all supplies, artillery, and all the command and control for that portion of the theater at that particular point. So it was a key installation in the North of Vietnamese that made a major, major uh, effort to position forces to take that uh, based on their experiences at way and uh, earlier in the uh, Tet Offensive. And this was, area, this particular area, our time was called a post-Tet Offensive. Uh, the terrain and all that, the bunkers were our typical A-frame bunkers. They were tough to collapse. Uh, even tanks would run up on them and they couldn't collapse them. The terrain was open rice paddies and it was just a tough area to fight in because you didn't have the cover and concealment you need. And the only thing that provided you assets to protect yourself, which a lot of gunfire support from naval gunfire, artillery, air, helicopter gunships that we had significant support. Uh, he, after the uh, battle there in the first phase, as I said, the condition of my company, which was one of the questions, was not very good. We only had about 40 Marines left and a golf company probably had 50 or 60 left. And the hotel, which I'll we'll talk about in, uh, next, only had about uh, probably about 70 Marines left. The next phase of the operation was very significant. And the significance was that the General Bill Weiss, then Lieutenant Colonel Bill Weiss, directed that hotel come around my left flank and continue the attack and, uh, against the, the uh, village of Dido and subsequent villages. Uh, they bypassed me to my left. Uh, they moved about 200 yards in front of me. Uh, the North Vietnamese were ready for them. And as soon as they got in the uh, general area, they uh, executed the counterattack against hotel company. And a uh, hotel company is a acting company commander, got wounded. A young uh, lieutenant named Vic Taylor took over. But it became very apparent to me that this uh, company, remnants of Hotel 2-4, was fixing to be overrun. So uh, I just said to hell with it. And uh, I said, Echo, I'm going up there uh, to try to help, uh, make sure the hotel company survives this engagement. 
So all of them agree, all the Marines from Echo were remaining and went with me and we linked up with the hotel company and we continued a big push against the North Vietnamese and overrun a couple of trench lines and the, uh, there was such a significant threat in that area in terms of numbers, which we had no indications how many people were in there. Uh, they were just throwing human wave after human wave after human wave at us. And the Marines uh, and the sailors, uh, docks, were magnificent. They did a great job in defending that area up to the point the attrition became uh, so bad amongst the Marines and also the lack of ammunition. It became a it, it became a hand to hand dogfight. And uh, God bless the young Marines. Uh, they stood their ground, and I was always so proud of every one of them that was there, and how they encountered it and how they reacted. And every one of them was a Marine to the end. And uh, unfortunately, uh, during this particular phase of the operation, uh, I stepped across the trench line and uh, a Vietnamese that was firing an inter aircraft gun shot me through the leg with a 50 caliber machine gun and I went down and all the Marines uh, saw that fact and uh, they reacted because I was a senior man and I'd sort of been a guy, I guess, pushing him to continue the attack and when I went down, things began to sort of come un, uh, unglued. So my advice to them was to get the hell out of the area and leave me here and I'd cover the withdrawal, but God bless them, you know, the Marines take care of their own and I guess they considered me uh, the boss at that point and so they took care of their own and a couple of young black Marines that had been wounded after we went through this dog fight and they killed uh, just, I don't know how many in VA. Uh, they dragged me back and uh, we pulled all the Marines back and pulled all the wounded Marines back and uh, they reconsolidated and uh, this sort of terminated my involvement in it. And I was medevaced and sent aboard ship and I was operated on six or seven times and ultimately medevaced to Hawaii where I recuperated for a couple of months. But I went back to visit this area a few years later and the thing was very apparent to me. We had the residual forces of this turned out to be a North Vietnamese uh, division boxed up at the end of the village of Dido because if we'd pushed them out in the open because of the gunships, because of the uh, fixed wing, artillery, naval gunfire, uh, they would have been slaughtered at that point. So they were fighting to the death just like we were fighting to the death. Uh, I would uh, give them uh, an A plus, the damn guys knew how to fight but they uh, never run up against Marines the way we were prepared to be. Uh, we were prepared to fight because we'd been there working together for about seven or eight months. And as I told the Marines in Echo, we were prepared to do the NFL fight. And God bless us, we had trained. We had been in a lot of engagements. So we were about the most prepared battalion uh, in the Marine Corps at that point to get involved in a fight at this time. So I think the thing that I recall uh, that really sort of resonates in my mind is the spirit, the enthusiasm, the uh, just the pure simplified spirit of the Marines that were involved in that fight and how they stood their ground even against overwhelming numbers, lack of ammunition. But at the end of the day, when the battle was over, uh, the North Vietnamese uh, division of about 10,000 people we're up against about 800 Marines with this gunfire support. And they went home and they left a lot of bodies on the battlefield. There's the numbers between three and 4,000 of the 10,000 were either killed or wounded, probably most of them were killed. Uh, Echo Company, uh, as I told you, went from uh, 180 down to uh, about 35 or 40. And at the end of the day, uh, I'm told, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, we lost approximately 100 Marines in uh, Second Battalion, Fourth Marines. They were killed and about 296 medevacs and there were about 150 or so that were not medevacs that were wounded. So it was a hell of a fight and probably one of the last, if not the last big fight in Vietnam. And if we had lost that fight and they had seized Dong Ha, the psychological impact on this country and on all the forces associated with that fight that was going on in May of 68 would have been just something I don't think uh, the country could have dealt with at that point after Way City and Saigon and all the other things that had transpired up to that particular fight.
A question was posed to me uh, about uh, notification about a receipt of the Medal of Honor. Let me just make one thing very clear about this. Uh, my intention of being a Marine captain and being a company commander was to do my job, to do my mission, and to bring the Marines home. As far as going over there trying to get a Medal of Honor or get any award in Vietnam, that was never even crossed my mind. But uh, I was recognized, I guess, for whatever uh, contributions I made, and the recommendation was to uh, forward award recommended me and uh, Jay Vargas uh, for the Medal of Honor. And uh, this thing uh, was involved in the administrative process for about two and a half years. They had to go through all these checks and balances at all levels to make sure all the various levels of command, the levels of the government concurred with the recommendation. And I was assigned down at Fort Benning, Georgia uh, as the Assistant Marine Corps Rep when I was notified back in 1970. And uh, the Commander General and Army General called me up to his office and said, you're going to Washington, you're going to receive the Medal of Honor. He's a wonderful man, a very inspirational letter, leader, and I went up with my boss, the Marine Colonel, and we went up and uh, talked about the details of it, how to get the family there, and this was in 70 when air was not as available as you might expect. And I uh, got all the family rounded it up, and after we were notified, we went to D.C. We were hosted by the Marine Corps, and there were about seven or eight other recipients at that particular ceremony. But it was a wonderful ceremony. People took great care of us, uh, wine to dine us for two or three days, and the family for two or three days. So it was a great experience for the family, both my wife and my young daughter, and also my, my mom and dad, my, and my brother and sister-in-law. So it was first class, great memories. Uh, Nixon uh, was very, uh, very kind and uh, very uh, honoring and made quite a few uh, great gestures towards family. So great memory, uh, but uh, the, the big thing that I recall most of all, again, is the significance of the Battle of Dido and the performance of the young Marines and sailors. So whatever I got out of this award, I wear it for the young Marines and sailors. Primarily didn't make it home from Echo Company, but for all of them, their blood, their sweat, their commitment, their professionalism is tied up in this award and I wear it for them and I don't wear it for myself. So uh, the experience of Dido I did not let define my life. I wanted to be a Marine every day of the week, but uh, the experience of that I would certainly uh, placed me in positions I would not have been otherwise, or the Medal of Honor uh, Award places me in positions I wouldn't be otherwise, but uh, the key to, uh, I think, the holy experiences, I enjoyed being a Marine, I enjoyed being associated Marines, I enjoyed lead Marines. Uh, one of the uh, elements of my life is being a recipient of the Medal of Honor, obviously. And I hope I wear it with uh, dignity and pride and in memory of those young Marines that didn't, didn't make it home. So God bless uh, Secretary and Fourth Marines, uh, affectionately called a magnificent bastard. It was my uh, pleasure, my honor uh, to command Echo Company Secretary and Fourth Marines and have the opportunity to serve with those exceptional young uh, 18, 19, and 20 year old Marines that give it all and God bless them for loving their country and being willing to uh, go down range when I asked them to go around range and never hesitated. So the fighting capacity of young Americans is remarkable. If they're trained properly, led properly, motivated properly and equipped properly and I think Echo Company, not because of me, but I think Echo Company, because of all the NCOs, staff NCOs, and young officers, had all those qualities associated with it. So God bless Echo, God bless Secretary of Fourth Marines, and I'll tell you all of you, remember, the Marine Corps is a real simplify outfit. Once again, I'm Colin Heaton, and we hope you enjoyed this segment on Forgotten History. If you would like to know more about the Battle of Dai Do and Dong Ha, as well as the career and life of Major General James Livingston, Medal of Honor recipient in the Battle of Dai Do, then please get the book Noble Warrior, and you can go to our website at www.heatonlewisbooks.com and gather more information on how to get that. 
If you like this segment of Forgotten History, please click like and then subscribe and leave your comments. We welcome all comments and we will respond as soon as we can. Thank you.